All right, we get back as promised to that conversation on civil society on the cross. We have with us John Gidongo, Chair Africog. We have Waringa Wahome, who is a lawyer, Madare Social Justice Centre. We have Virungu Houghton, who is the ED, Amnesty International Kenya. So there were those questions raised, and I was reading that letter uh, to the Ford Foundation uh, by uh, the PS of Foreign Affairs, Korea Simoe, and he talked about it is noteworthy that several of your grantees below mentioned received a total of approximately 652 million shillings between April 2023 and May 2024 with unexplained expedited funding amounting to 194 million shillings approximately over the last month alone. Deeply concerning is that most of the grantees have been at the center of the anti-finance bill protests and the subsequent um, anarchic mobilization that have sought to upend the peace and security of the state. What do you make of that statement? No, I, I mean, I said earlier that I think that the Ford Foundation will be found innocent of all the uh, allegations that are there. I think what we have to recognize is, first of all, that you know, funding, uh, let's start for, with some very basic uh, points. Article 37 provides for the right to assembly. Um, peaceful protests are guaranteed within our constitution. In fact, they are, historically, they have been a way in which citizens have been able to make um, governments course correct on a number of issues. If you go back 100 years, the Cavirondo Taxpayers Association uh, among the local community were basically pushing back against punitive taxes back in the 1920s. Um, if you look at the Harambe Schools Movement, that's civil society. If you look at um, the unions, the students that were involved in the 1970s and 80s, the second liberation, many NGOs were involved in that process. And I think what we have now is the third liberation led by the Gen Zs that they don't require NGOs to organize them. I mean, that's the thing that I think most Gen Zs who are watching are probably feeling a bit offended, is that somehow, um, you know, 8,000 non-governmental organizations and probably 30,000 civil society organizations are at the center of this. And at the middle of the, at the, 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 the root of that is the Ford Foundation. I think for the Gen Z, what they've been saying is that you know th there are some real systemic problems in this country and I think that's what we need to push back on and just uh, advise the government to focus on the issues that are being raised by the Gen Z movement rather than a funding cycle um, a funding disbursement of one donor among the 200 donors that are funding 8,000 organizations in this country at the moment so I'm not convinced. Do you view this um, Waringa as a threat to the civil society space this rhetoric this narrative that is being spoken and that John says is not new. I think the first thing when they talk about security is that security for who? Because if, it is, if you're talking about security for looters, then of course it's disrupting security for looters. But the people, it is the police that expend violence and it is not a question of doubt. I think with all of these abductions... And but not just the police, because yeah. we have seen businesses uh, looted. We have seen that during these protests. Is that the police? But the key question that you must ask yourself is, how many or how much has the government been looting? The key question is not even about what is going on right now in the streets. It's that the government in itself is perpetrating all of this. It is the government that is perpetrating it. You know, it is the people that continue to loot people, to create poverty, to create structures of dependency. It is they that need to be accountable to the people. Because if you talk about security, the people are living in poverty. You know, they are living in conditions that are undignified. They are living in death traps. That one day rain can rain and it will take away your whole humanity. That is not security. You know, people are living not sure what you're, what you're gonna eat tomorrow. You know, everyday parents are thinking about, my God, how will my child go to school? That's violence. You know, when you think about, what will I eat tomorrow? You know, these days when you skip lunch, you're happy, not because you're losing on your weight, it's because you've saved the money you would have spent for lunch. Like in Isasa, Shelly, are you secure? You're not secure. The government has continually been perpetrating violence against the people of Kenya. You know, even these business people, you know, you're protecting every day, you're paying too much taxes that are being stolen and looted you know, by specific individuals who are also being reshuffled in government. You know, while the government struggles to, you know, it's floundering here just trying to survive. You know, they're reshuffling cabinet so that people can secure specific positions on specific spaces, but not for the people, for themselves. So when they talk about disruption of security, you know, when they talk about anarchy, they're talking about that their own lives are being disrupted. But consistently, our lives have been disrupted. Mm -hmm. You know, even when you talk about, you know, even this protest itself, you know, it did not come from the sky. 
you know, it did not just come poop and people are tired and want to go to parliament. It is a, it is a struggle that has been going on for many, many years. As Irongo is saying, it is shouldering on the struggles of against Moism. Because if there is anything that we must agree at this point, it is that we are dealing with Kanuism without Moi and Moism without Moi. Okay. It's just a character of the same person. So they're just trying to correct, you know, they're just changing faces. The same thing they're doing with this cabinet reshuffle. You know, I saw on the news saying that, you know, Regadi is calling it uh, a new look something. New look cabinet? Mm -hmm. New look cabinet? Is it a new look? Is anyone new? Who looks, who does Yeah, the five people who are new. Okay. All right, John, let me ask you to come in at this point. Uh, we focus a lot on the role civil society played during the protests, but what role can they play now in moving Kenya forward, in securing uh, the gains that Gen Z have managed to get? I think the, the first thing is, is the civil society is working hard. That's part of the reason we're here, to defend the space. You know, that's, uh, that's key. Um, I think it's also to, to refocus um, um, Olive, because one of my concerns is that, you know, and we were discussing this with, with, with Irongo and Waringa earlier, that we don't want civil society to become the story. There's a far bigger thing happening in our society as Kenyans. And, um, w you know, in a sense, what's happening to civil society organizations, as disruptive as it is, is a bit of a sideshow. Kenyans are asking far more fundamental questions. You know, you look at that, this, this young man, Joseph Mwangi, one month you know, he's disappeared uh, and he suddenly is, is released. But we know many other people who've disappeared. We don't know where they are, whether they've been kidnapped, uh, arrested, uh, others who've turned up dead. That's, that's significant. Then two other key issues, which at least when I was on the, on, on the street just listening to young people when, when parliament was, was being uh, breached, um, two, two key issues which are very important to, to be dealt with, far more important than what's happening to civil society, which is um, the president is confronted not with a political crisis, but a governance crisis, in that people don't believe him. That's huge. You know, he's the chief executive of Kenya Inc. He has to be believed. He has to be able to say, I'm going to switch off the lights tomorrow, and people believe him. That's a big problem, and it's only him who can fix that. Secondly, um, there's been a huge amount of debate about the, the finance bill, you know, and it's, it's important, but it's clear now, and just listening to young people on the streets, that the finance bill was merely a trigger to a more fundamental issue around corruption. And again, the person at the center of that web is the president. Uh, and I've listened to all the statements that he has made uh, since this crisis broke out. It's an issue that he tends to avoid. Until he can confront it in his own office, very directly, then I think we're going to be dancing around some of the fundamental issues that I think are being raised by, by our young people. And you know, it doesn't matter how many new cabinets or new ministers are brought in, the skepticism is fundamental, and the head of state himself is confronted with a governance crisis that he must, must address in that people no longer believe him. That's, that's very important. It's, it's, it has consequences for all of us uh, as Kenyans that uh, um, you know, we don't trust the word of the chief executive of the country. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Irungu, I was listening to President William Ruto uh, during a Mo Ibrahim Foundation event uh, in 2022. And he echoed the same sentiments we had, Uhuru Kenyatta, the very jarring ones, you know, where he said, you're kissing ass uh, to those of those, the people, the, basically whoever pays the piper calls the tune mm -hmm. at the expense of the communities in which you work. So. There's a thread that carries through. Is there truth to it? Yeah. So I, I was there at the um, Mo Ibrahim weekend and, um, you know, Ruth, uh, I guess, loosely translated what he said was, who funds you feeds you, mm -hmm. right? Um, and I think, you know, we can't be selective in that wisdom, if we can use the term wisdom for that analysis, because if it's true for NGOs, then it's also true for the government. Right? So I think we have to say that if, you know, if, it is simply as sim if it's as simple as that, then uh, the government also has a governance problem. Right? Um, but let me, let me come back to a couple of points. I think one is, you know, I think Kenyans, um, Kenyans should not at this point over glorify the civil society organizations in terms of what has been happening. As we've said, you know, this was a, essentially a movement that was not leaderless, it was leaderful. It's not agendaless, it has many agendas and the agendas keep changing. Um, it doesn't seek central funding, it crowdsources its funding or it crowdfunds and it crowd thinks. 
right? That's why it's, it's so dynamic, mm. right? So these X spaces are really spaces like the parliament mm. where people are thinking through what are the policy mm. issues, what do we need to mm. take action on, and so on. Mm. So that's the nature of this movement. And I think once the state recognizes this, and I, you know, I, I, I like to hear, you know, the, I like to hear the deputy president talk about this movement with the respect that he does sometimes, where he talks about these are patriotic Kenyans, these are uh, young people who are thinking about the future of this country and so on. Um, because I agree with him on that, on that point. But I think the other thing, um, you know, if we were to discuss what has been the role of civil society organizations, it's not, um, you know, a secret. Many of us have essentially articulated the right to assembly. We have said that the, the right to protest is a constitutionally guaranteed freedom that is at the center of our democracy. For many of us, um, we have been involved in civic education, we human rights education, essentially working with young people, working with um, even uh, alpha generation and the public to get them to understand what is in our constitution, what rights does it contain, and what responsibilities do Kenyans have. So that's kind of like something that has been going for the last 10 years or more. The third, second area really has been around legal representation. Um, in the story with uh, Paul Mwangi, and I just have to say, like uh, John, you know, just how shocking it is that a Kenyan could be held in a black, black site, a place that is not registered as a police station for about a month, abducted without his family knowing he is incommunicado, no access to lawyers, uh, no access to his mother. Um, how is that possible under our laws, right? It's just unlawful. Um, but we have worked on issues around mass arbitrary arrests. We have worked on issues of abduction. We have worked, worked on issues of uh, the use of excessive force. And it's partly that work that has seen a change in the leadership of the police command. So I think we have to say um, you know, that this work must continue. Um, the third area really has been, and I just want to shout out not just to the lawyers who've been doing the legal representation work, but to medical officers you know, who set up pop-up emergency medical centers in the cities and the towns where the protests are taking place and are providing emergency health care for the people that needed it. And they are being arrested for it. And they are being tear gassed for it. And, you know, so I think there, is been, there has been a role that civil society has played. But I think to associate that we are at the center of the movement is probably not helpful. On the issue of funding, the president, in, you know, I think in, in, in a stroke of genius about two months ago, uh, commenced the PBO Act. Mm -hmm. This is the Public Benefits Organizations Act. It had been sitting for over a decade. And, and actually preempt my next question, which right. was, um, you had reason to be optimistic. This thing, the PBO Act, like you said, was lying dormant from 2013, and he, it, it got affected in May, yeah. uh, 14th of May. So that was reason for you to be optimistic that this president, uh, it might not be the same as it has been previously. No, no, I, I think the, the commencement of the Public Benefits Organizations Act, which of course was a Kenya Kwanzaa promise, right? Um, and for some of us, we thought it was going to be another round of um, promises not uh, delivered. And, you know, it was a promise uh, at some point within Jubilee as well. But he commenced it. And we look forward really to, and we look forward, let me just say it, it's not in the past tense, we look forward to a more um, clearer partnership with the state on the issues that affect our people. Um, now, the public benefits organization at its center has the uh, promise of opening up social justice philanthropy, philanthropy, giving Kenyans the opportunity to contribute to the work of AFRICOG, to the work of Amnesty, AMREF, um, all the organizations doing agriculture, health, and, and education work as well. And I think that's what um, will essentially reduce the dependency on international donors. I've often gone into international donor spaces and I said, look, until Kenyans can fund human rights work, then my work as Amnesty International is not complete. Um, Kenyans need to fund this work because it is essentially in the, in the national interest. And I think that's why the PBO Act is so important. So I, I think it's important at this point to hold on to the space that the president created two months ago and not have it uh, disappear because of some, in, you know, I guess some tension um, around the protests. We need to be strategic and long term in terms of thinking about the relationship between CSOs and the state. All right. Um, Waringa, does this mark a shift, the events of the last month, uh, where civic engagement is concerned? And I ask that because the more established uh, civil society organizations have been accused of being resolutionist, that they go for conferences, and then they pass resolutions, and they call a press conference, then they read out their resolutions. <laughs> Whereas the grassroots movement, uh, I suppose Madare Social Justice Center is one, are viewed more revolutionarily. 
Uh, I think the key thing is that uh, there has been a whole process, even if you look at the history of the social justice movement. Of course, it has its relationship with the uh, progressive uh, non governmental organizations, you know, in the extent of, you know, advancing the question of human rights and social justice. But at the same time, um, the social justice itself is in the process or has been in an active struggle of building grassroots democracy for a long couple of years that have gone back. Because right now, for example, Madare Social Justice Center is celebrating its 10 years of its existence, you know, advancing the question of human, social justice and human rights. Rights. But um, you know, NGOs have their own ways of operating. But you see, the, the nature of the social justice movement is that it works directly linked with the people. So we, you know, it is in direct understanding. You know, it's never too above where the people are, and it's never below where the people are. It is always interlinked and interlinked. In, you know, interrelated with the struggles that the people are going through, because. Um, you know, even if you look at all the progressive Saba Saba, you know, demonstrations that have been done, you know, giving life to the marches of our lives. You know, every every seventh of July, you know, there were protests remind you know, reminding every single person, you know, awaking the consciousness of people to realize that we are marching for our livelihoods. You know, every year, every year, every year consecutively since 20, 2018. You know, it has had protests around the question of livelihoods, around the question of social justice, and around the question of human rights. And of course, even now where we are, and the question that is being addressed now, you know, the violence that has been meted on the people. You know, if, if there is anyone to be called criminal, it is the government. You know, it is a criminal government. It is a negligent government that doesn't care about its people, doesn't give regard to their livelihoods. So the social justice movement, in the spirit of building grassroots democracy, you know, in the spirit of advan you know, advancing the question of good governance, good demo you know, social justice, you know, democracy that is based on social justice and human rights. You know, advancing that question because it is only in achieving Article 43 of the Constitution that we can actually guarantee livelihoods of our people. You know, it is only in guaranteeing that we can access food, we can access healthcare, we can access education, we can access quality education specifically, and we can access, you know, our environment itself can be clean and safe for existence as human beings. And of course, even this period, for sure, non-governmental organizations have played a major role you know, in documentation of the violations that have been going on. Every time something happens, and of course, even now, we are still in the process of documenting all of those violations. And if you look at the protests that were done during um, you know, Raila's time when he was trying to, 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 to address that question for his own reasons. But, um, you know, during that time, even Madara Social Justice Center was very key in documenting, you know, how many lives, you know, how, how violent the government was to its people. You know, murdering so many people and all of those questions and all of those people and all of those, those people that were martyred by the state. You know, the record of it is, you know, it's online, it's everywhere to be seen for people. And, you know, after that process of documentation, again, and as what Kedongo was addressing, the government criminalizes because now an attack came on Madare Social Justice Center. You know, we started being questioned on our legality. Okay. It's, a, it's a continued smear campaign. Even they asked us to change our name, to change our objectives so that we can stop addressing the question of human rights and social justice. Right. But now the Occupy movement being birthed from that, you know, is a continuation of a struggle. Mm. So in 2013, um, and, and thanks for that um, insight, uh, Waringa, but in 2013 there was a proposal to limit uh, foreign funding for civil society organizations to no more than 15% of their budget. Do you think that is at the crux of the issue, the amount that comes from outside the country? I think, I think that um, if you want to disrupt uh, a portion of society that you feel is not in your political interests. Um, hitting their resources is something that we've seen before. You know, questions about where the resources are coming from. What is curious about that, you know, this really bizarre attack on the Ford Foundation, that the Ford Foundation has actually been at the forefront of supporting a whole range of progressive uh, initiatives from within government, you know. And I have worked with them, uh, like, like Irongo, for the past 30 years from, as a consultant, within civil society, within government, and then outside. And um, so it's, you know, again, I, and I don't want to overemphasize this because it has such major implications for an important section of Kenya is a free and liberal society. And when you attack civil society, when you, especially when you attack media, um, you are attempting to change that, to, you know, to, to pour cold water on that. And, but I, again, I, I say you know, there's, there are more fundamental things uh, at play in our, uh, in our society with, with the protests that we are seeing uh, across the country. And my sense is just, again, listening to young people on, on the Twitter spaces, listening to them on the streets, uh, it is not unlikely, and we're seeing the same kind of um, um, youth energy across Africa, whether it's Sahel or Senegal, and it's going to spread in other countries, um, the, the entire relationship with the international community will also be rebooted by what's happening. And I think, for me, standing back and taking a, a 
you know, a better perspective in terms of uh, analyzing this is important. Right now, the, the attacks, maybe I've been in this business for too long, uh, the attacks seem so familiar. The, the, the stories, the narratives that are being pushed out, even my friend uh, Korir, this is, it's, it's almost boring. I said, come on, write another one. You know, we, this was 1990. At least you know you, you, you beef up, you spruce up the language of attacking civil society if you're going to do it uh, effectively. But it's the same tired tropes. So sometimes I will say, OK, let's deal with it, because you have to deal with it to keep co continue functioning. But let us not lose our eyes uh, on the prize. All right, so we take a break. We'll come back. We'll have your last remarks on which way forward, how to mend that fractious relationship between CSOs and government. Is it an appreciation of the roles you play on the other side of this break?